At last we come to the video where we will see how PCA actually finds the projection vectors. So here we just quickly recap the setup that we're using. We've got some data x1 up to x uh, capital N uh, and we assume um, the data has been mean normalized. Um, very often we also normalize the variance um, and you can have a look at previous videos for why that might be a good idea. And our goal is that we want to find these projection uh, vectors W1 up to W capital M, which will allow us to project the data into uh, M dimensional space. We assume that our projection vectors are unit length. Okay, so all of them um, just have a length of one and we assume that they're all orthogonal. Okay, um, so if you take the dot product between any of the projection vectors, then you get zero and we will get some idea also from the derivation for why these assumptions are good and why these constraints are, are necessary so the problem is basically that we want to find these capital m um, projection vectors so that we keep as much information as possible from the original data and in an earlier video we looked at different views of PCA and one view is that PCA tries to find the projections that retains as much of the variance um, of the original data as possible. So let's take that view and let's just first see how we will find the first projection vector using this example where we're going from two dimensions down to one dimensions. So we've got different choices for this projection and vector w1. One choice might lead to a line maybe running here, okay? Um, and if we then project onto that line, so for example, this data point goes down to the line there, and this data point goes down here, that data point goes down there. Then um, if we look at the projection in the new space, okay, and the new space in this case is just a straight line, uh, let's say that's zero, okay, and this new line, let's just call the axis here, let's just call that um, the Z1 line, okay, because it's the projection onto our first vector, okay. Um, then if we put down the data points, then uh, let's see, so this dot here will end up maybe, I don't know, somewhere here. Um, this one here will end up somewhere here, and you can project down all the points like this, okay, so that one might end up there and there, um, I don't know, this one very close to the origin on that side, so somewhere here, okay, you get the idea. Okay, and that line is uniquely identified by our projection vector running here, and that would be W1. We could have chosen a different line, right? We could have chosen a, a line running maybe somewhere there, okay? And if we then project on that line, these blue dots, right, will land at different points on that line. Um, specifically for that line, they will pr probably be all closer to the origin, which means that the variance in the new space will be lower than the solid green line that I picked here. So the problem in PCA is basically how do I um, pick this line? How do I pivot this line um, so that I get um, the, the biggest variance, right? Okay, so just sticking with this one dimensional example, we can actually write down an equation for the sample variance when we're projecting onto this Z1 um, space. In an earlier video, you can go and look, but we've got an equation for the sample variance. So we're trying to um, calculate the sample variance on this Z1 axis, okay? And this is just equal to one over N, the sum, over all our training data points from little n equal to one up to big n, okay? From, and then what we do is we take each of our data points. So this is just z n, our projection, okay? We're just looking at the first axis. So we're just doing one, the first um, component, minus, and then we subtract the sample mean, okay? Again, for the first component, squared. Okay, that's a pretty simple equation. Still doesn't tell us how we find our Ws. There's actually no W in there, so we, we need to fix that. Before that, we can actually simplify it a little bit. Um, since we assume that the the data has been mean normalized, right? So this means that um, the Xn's are zero mean. Um, if that's true, you can actually go and convince yourself that the means of the projections will also be zero. 
okay? If you project uh, linearly, then the mean of the projections will also be zero. So that thing there uh, is just zero. Try and write it out and make sure that you can see um, why that's the case. So that means that we can actually write down the sample variance uh, in a very short little equation. That would just be Z1 N and then just the square of uh, all of my projections for all of my data points. Now, like I said, there's actually no W1 in there, so we need to probably start by fixing that. So um, just on the, the previous uh, video, we saw how we actually calculate the projection uh, Z1N, and it's simply the dot product of the data point with W1. Okay, so we can substitute that in right easily, okay? So we've got 1 over N, the sum, 1 to big N of the dot product between W1, my projection vector, and each of my data points. Okay, and then I've got the square from there. Now we can unpack that a little bit further. I'm going to use a quick trick where um, if we've got the square of um, stuff with vectors, then we can actually write that out as um, taking what's inside the braces times the transpose of what's inside the braces. Okay, so we can write that out as 1 over n, sum of n equal to 1, n, w1, transpose, xn, times w1, transpose, xn, transpose. Actually, this thing is just a scalar, right? So the transpose of a scalar is just the same. So I can always take the transpose of a scalar number. Okay, you'll see in a second why I'm, I'm doing these slightly weird tricks. Okay. Um, it's because what I can now do is I can remember when I take the transpose, I can flip these two and then it becomes transpose x times w1. Okay. And that allows me to basically split up this equation a little bit. So what I will do is I will take this w1 and I will move it out. I keep the 1 over n. I keep the sum n equal 1 n. I keep this uh, xn because I'm taking the transpose. I flip these two so I get xn transpose transpose of that monstrosity, and then I get W1T transpose. Uh, no, rubbish. Uh, just W1 because I'm taking the transpose of the transpose, so the transpose goes away. Okay, so that's what I end up with. Just as a note, I could take this W1 out, right, because it doesn't depend on my little n. It's the same for all, uh, for all the terms that I'm summing up. Similarly, this thing is actually um, you can just multiply it after you've done the summation. So we can actually put brackets around here. And the reason I put the brackets here is because if you paid attention in one of the previous videos, you will actually notice that you might know what this is. Okay. Specifically, this is actually the sample covariance matrix of um, my data Xn, if it's zero mean, which it is because I normalized my data beforehand. So I can actually write this out as W1 transpose, and then sigma, that's not a summation, this is a matrix. That is my sample covariance matrix times W1. Frank. Okay, um, normally what will happen is if you, if you don't have the zero mean assumption, you've got Xn minus the sample mean times xn minus the sample mean transpose. Okay, and that gives you your sample covariance matrix. But since the mean is zero, um, that thing is our sample covariance matrix. Let's just take a step back. What we want to do is we want to find the w1 where, which maximizes this thing, right? So um, if we have a data set, we can calculate the sample covariance matrix that will always stay the same. And for w, different w1s, we will get different um, sample projected variances, okay? So we want to find the W1s, which makes this thing as big as possible. Okay, so what will we, uh, will we do? We will take the partial derivatives of this thing with respect to W1. Not quite, because there's actually a few constraints that we need to keep track of. And since we're just projecting onto one vector, um, the orthogonality constraint isn't actually that important. We, we just have a W1, we don't have a W2, 3, or 4, and so on. So the only constraint that, that's important for us is this unit length constraint. You can actually see why this constraint is important. 
because if you look at this equation, I could actually maximize my variance. I could make it arbitrarily large, but just making W1 as big as possible. Okay, so that just means I keep on making that vector long, longer and longer, longer. And that gives me a very um, big sample variance after projecting, which obviously won't make and won't be a sensible projection. So that's why we actually have this constraint. Okay, so we need to maximize this thing um, with the constraint, so subject to that the, the projection vector W1 um, has unit length. So this is where we're going to use uh, Lagrange multipliers that we saw in a previous video to make sure that we meet this unit length constraint. Okay, and the unit length constraint, you can also write that out as just the square is equal to one. That's the same thing. Um, and then the way we will write it for the loss is just if you take the um, vector, you take the transpose, um, you multiply it with the vector, then you should get one. These two things are exactly the same, but we're just going to write it this way, um, which will make it a little bit easier to see exactly how we differentiate. So if we use a Lagrange multiplier, that gives us the loss. Um, I'm going to write it as j, a function of w1, okay? And normally when, when I write j, you know that I want to minimize it. So we want to maximize this thing, but I'll, I like writing things always just in terms of the loss or the um, that we're trying to minimize. So we want to maximize this thing. That's the same as minimizing the negative of that thing. But I need my Lagrange multiplier constraint. Okay, and, and you can go back to a previous video, but one way to write this is just to say that we have our um, scalar lambda, okay, which we now introduce, and we've got W1 transpose W1 minus one. That's our constraint, okay? So if, if we um, maximize this thing with respect to W1 um, and with respect to lambda, then we will meet the constraint. Substituting in um, what we found on the previous slide, plus lambda w1 transpose w1 minus 1. Okay, perfect. So let's minimize this thing uh, with respect to w1. So we're going to minimize that thing with respect to w1. And that makes means taking the partial derivatives of j with respect to w1. And now the second bit of background knowledge that we need here is um, what this means, right? So this thing is, this is a scalar value. It's, it's one value, but it's a function of the vector. And that means we need to take the partial derivatives with respect to a vector. Okay, so we need to know how to do that. And you can go back to um, one of the previous videos where I talked about this. And in there, you will see that there's actually two identities that I give there. And one, one of them is for taking the partial derivative of a vector transpose times a symmetric matrix times um, uh, the vector again. Okay, and you will see there, you can also go and look on Wikipedia, that the partial derivative of that is minus two, the symmetric matrix times the vector W1. Similarly, again, go and check out Wikipedia, you can get the the identity for taking um, vector transpose times vector and taking the partial derivatives of that with respect to that vector. And you can go and see that that will just be two times the vector. Okay, we want to minimize this. So we set um, this, this whole thing equal to zero. Remember that this is actually a vector. This thing is a vector where, with respect to the partial derivatives of the first element, the second element, and so on for all d elements of w. So actually we want to set all of them equal to zero. And what this gives us, uh, let's do some um, primary school math here. Okay, we, are, we can eliminate the twos and we can take, uh, I don't know, uh, this one to the other side. And that gives the equation. Now I ask you, does that look familiar? This equation is just the eigenvalue, eigenvector equation, the last bit of background math that I, I spoke about before. So this means that if I take, um, I take my sample covariance matrix, okay, and I find the eigenvalues, val eigenvectors, then um, if I find one of the eigenvalue, eigenvector pairs, then that would be correspond to lambda being the eigenvalue and w1 being my eigenvector. Great, 
And that's awesome because in NumPy or MATLAB, there's just a eigenvalue function. So you can just call that and get the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The one thing is that there will be more than one eigenvalue eigenvector quer um, pair. So the question is, which one of the eigenvalue eigenvectors do I use? So if we manipulate this equation, equation one a little bit, let's see what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to left multiply on both sides with W1 transpose. Okay, and this thing, because of the a unit length constraint that's just equal to one okay so what we get here is that lambda is equal to w1 transpose sample covariance matrix w1 uh, i've got a different name for that thing and that's just called the sample variance of my projection z1 okay and what do i want from that thing what do i want that that to be i want this to be maximized um remember that the solution here here we've got the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors. Okay, remember, so lambda, in other words, is um, one of the eigenvalues. And what I want to do is I want this thing to be as big as possible. So I'm simply going to pick the eigenvalue um, with the largest number, and then I'm going to use its corresponding eigenvector, and that will be my first projection vector. So we did that whole derivation for, for finding the first um, projection vector okay how will we find the second projection vector okay what if we're um, going from three dimensions down to two or from 100 dimensions down to 50 um, we found the first projection vector how do we find the next one okay you actually just go exactly through the same steps okay you have an additional constraint now however so you want to find w2 but you want to make sure that it has unit length and that it is orthogonal to the first projection vector. And you can actually go through the steps, and then you will see that um, if you do that, you end up with the following equation. So for the first projection vector, we ended up with, with this equation. If we repeat the steps with both of these constraints, so you have a slightly more intricate uh, Lagrangian um, loss function, then you end up with this equation, which looks quite familiar. And what this tells us is that to pick the second projection vector, you will simply pick the eigenvector corresponding to the second highest eigenvalue. And for the third um, vector, if you, if you want to project down to three dimensions, we'll do the same. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to repeat these steps. And if you want to find, uh, I don't know, you're going from 100 down to five, then you simply find, use the five eigenvectors that um, ha corresponds to the five biggest eigenvalues. So the PCA um, algorithm basically boils down to finding eigenvalue eigenvectors um, after you've mean normalized your data. And with that, you actually know how to find um, the projection vectors for PCA. Here we used the view of PCA that it maximizes um, variance in the projected space. Um, in the next video, we will see that another view of PCA actually leads to exactly the same solution.